Brother Eric John Phelps, welcome to the podcast of 24-7 World Radio today on this Sunday, September 29th, 2024. I was requested by a dear listener, supporter, Sister Allison, to preach a message on how Satan copies God. How Satan copies God. Well, why wouldn't you copy God? He's the best. So if you have an end game, which Satan has an end game, wouldn't you seek to bring your end game to pass as the Lord is bringing his end game to pass? Sure. So Satan copies God in his quest to bring about the consummation of the mystery of iniquity, as we shall talk about it, whereby Satan's Antichrist, who will be the final Pope of Rome, slain with a sword in the middle of the 70th week of Daniel, to rise from the dead to be possessed of Satan indwelt by Satan, to then rule the world for 42 months. This is the end game of Satan, and so therefore he has a design to bring this to pass, and in designing to bring this to pass, he copies God. So, number one, God has a kingdom. We see that in Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, speaking of the Father, who, namely the Father, hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, which is omitted from all the new Bibles and the Westcott and Hort Greek text, redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So here we see that God has a kingdom, and namely it's the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are saved today, my friend, if you believe the gospel, that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again, if you've truly repented in conjunction with that belief, because there is no belief without true and godly repentance, For we know that godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. Repentance and belief of the gospel are hand in hand. And hence, if you've truly repented, pursuant to Acts chapter 17, verses 20, as God has commanded all men everywhere to repent, and have believed the gospel, pursuant to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, you are saved, and now you've been translated into the kingdom of God. Of Christ into the kingdom of the Son of God. And so by status you are a member of his kingdom. And you cannot lose that status. He has secured you. He has given you an inheritance that's undefiled, that fadeth not away, and is reserved in heaven for you if you have truly believed the gospel, which is that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and the only place in the New Testament where the gospel in its completion is given is in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So having believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're now in the kingdom of the Son of God. Well, Satan has a kingdom. In Luke chapter 11, verse 14, through 19, uh, through 20, 11 to 20, we read, If a son shall ask bread of any of you uh, that is a father, will he give him a stone? Of course not. Or if he ask a fish, will he give for a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Why, of course not. Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Why, of course not. Verse 13, if you then being evil, this is mankind now, 
Mankind is evil. Mankind is not basically good. Mankind has an evil nature. Each one of us have an evil nature that hates God. That's our Adamic fallen nature. That's the nature we receive from our parents, both from our mother and our father, when we were conceived. We're evil. So Christ says, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And he was, as he, and he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass that when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. So here the Lord Jesus Christ is casting out demons, also translated as devils in our King James Bible, which is fine because every demon is hooked up to and subject to his master, who is the devil. So to call them devils is okay. Even though the underlying Greek word is for demons, they are also, they are devils indeed, showing that the master of these demons is the devil himself. Verse 15, But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Of course, Beelzebub is Satan. So he's not doing it by the power of God. He's doing it by the power of the devil. So they're attributing this miracle to the devil. And others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven. Well, they already saw a demon that was cast out. Why would they now seek a sign from heaven? Because they were hard-hearted, evil men that hated Jesus of Nazareth, no matter how many good deeds or how many miracles he performed, there was always an excuse against him. There was always some justification for their unbelief and denying that he was who he said he was, namely the Son of God. But he, verse 17, knowing their thoughts said unto them, every kingdom divideth against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against itself falleth. Well, that's true for the United States today. The devil, the devil and his Roman papacy with the Jesuits have so divided this place that it's going to fall unless there's a great awakening and a great turning to Christ and a return to the Reformation English Bible, the AV 1611, and a return to sound doctrine and a return to worshipful music and not this modern day charismatic uh, secular, quote-unquote, contemporary Christian music, which is all of the devil. So, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, verse 18, If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Be Beelzebub. And if I, by Beelzebub, Cast out devils, by whom do your sons, the sons being the apostles, cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges, and indeed they shall be in the millennial kingdom. These will be resurrected to sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. They shall be your judges one day, speaking to the nation. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. So what's it going to be? Are you going to attribute my works to Satan, to Beelzebub, to his kingdom? Or are you going to attribute my works to God, if I by the finger of God cast out these devils? It's either or. It is a Bible-based biblical dualism in everything. And that's what this message also concerns. Satan copying God. We have God. And we have Satan, namely have we Christ versus Satan. And hence, we have Satan who's centered in mankind, so he's going to use mankind against Christ. So it's going to be man against Christ, man against God. So it's a Christian Bible-based dualism in everything. Satan has a kingdom. The Lord Jesus Christ has a kingdom. And if you're saved, you're in it. And by the way, Satan has a throne and God has a throne. In Revelation chapter 4, we see God the Father sitting on his throne, 
Revelation 4, verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardis stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto all, like unto an emerald. So, the, the centers of what is happening here is God the Father sitting on a throne. This is his throne in heaven. And the Lord Jesus Christ sits next to him on that throne. How do we know? We read in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, as the Lord is finishing up speaking to the church of Laodicea, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, that's the throne of David, yet to be established on earth, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father on, his, on the Father's throne. That's why we read in Psalm 110 verse 1, And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If Christ is going to sit at the right hand of God the Father, he has to be sitting with the Father on the Father's throne. And so God has a throne on which indeed the Father sits, and next to him at his right hand sits the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if God has the throne, well then Satan, he's got to have a throne. In the first century, we are informed as to where the throne of Satan was. We read in Revelation chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. This is Christ. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in the day, those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. In the first century, as this book of Revelation was given in 95, 96 AD at the time, under the reign of Domitian, the Roman emperor, we are told here by the prophet John, as he's getting these words from the Lord Jesus Christ, that Satan's seat, that underlying word there is throne. Where Satan's throne is. Satan was seated on a throne somewhere in Pergamos. This is a very famous city, very evil city. Uh, Tsar Alec, or Kaiser Wilhelm II had the temple there in Pergamos taken apart and it was rebuilt and re-put together in Berlin. Tsar or Kaiser Wilhelm II was a good Freemason, a knight of Malta, busy serving the Pope, betraying Germany, deliberately losing World War I with Ludendorff and Hindenburg. But here is Pergamos, and I maintain it was the temple in Pergamos that where Satan's seat was, where he dwelled. That where his, that's where his throne was. He has since moved his throne. According to Newell in his great work, uh, his commentary on Revelation, that the throne was moved from Pergamum, or Pergamos, to Rome in about the fourth century. Satan's throne is in the Vatican. Even Malachi Martin, the Jesuit, a late Jesuit, says in his book, Windswept House, that Satan sits in the Vatican. I believe him. He would know. So Satan has a throne, and it's an earthly throne. He has no heavenly throne, according to the scripture. He has an earthly throne, and it's always been in some earthly city. It was in Babylon at one time, moved to several other cities, then to Pergamos, and then finally to Rome. And so that's where Satan's throne is. It's in Rome. And so Satan, in ruling the world through Rome, 
naturally controls the religion of Rome, which is his church. It is his church. The Lord has a church and Satan has a church. The papacy is Satan's church. The Lord's church is dispersed throughout the world and there's no real center locale for it because it's a church composed of all the believers that have been saved and they're part of the body of Christ. They have the status of being in him, but there is no earthly location for the Lord's church. There is no earthly throne for the Lord's church. A throne to which the church is subject to is the Father's throne upon which Christ sits. And it's in the New Jerusalem, on the pinnacle of the New Jerusalem, where the Father and the Son sit on the Father's throne. So just as Christ will have an earthly throne, the throne of David when he establishes his Davidic kingdom, Satan has an earthly throne as he is ruling the world presently as the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, ruling it out of the Vatican. Satan has a throne and God has a throne. Satan, as the Lord, they have a consummation of their plan. Satan has a counsel to bring to pass the coming and establishment of his Antichrist. The Lord has a counsel to bring to pass the coming and establishment of the Lord Jesus Christ's Davidic kingdom, both of these kingdoms being on earth. They are not heavenly kingdoms. The throne of David is an earthly throne. The throne of Satan is an earthly throne. And so to bring about the establishment of the Lord's Davidic kingdom, there is a mystery of godliness in play. To bring about the establishment of Satan's mystery of, iniqui mystery of iniquity, there is a mystery in place to bring to pass the establishment of Satan's earthly, papal, popish kingdom turned antichrist with the murder assassination of the final pope. He'd arise from the dead the Pope that was and is not and yet is, the beast that was and is not and yet is, have a mortal sword wound, Revelation 13, 14. So there are two mysteries at play, and they parallel each other. One is the mystery of godliness, the other is the mystery of iniquity. Concerning this mystery of godliness, we read in 1 Timothy 3, 16. Now this is a favorite verse for the evil and wicked higher critics who are going to tell you that the most reliable manuscripts do not read this way. And this, of course, is the foundation for these quote-unquote reliable manuscripts like Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. By the way, Chris Pinto, with his Agilent Films, did a wonderful job in one of his presentations showing that the Sinaiticus manuscript was a forgery and that it was also backed by Rome in its discovery with Tischendorf, that sinner, who discovered this manuscript at St. Catherine's Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai. And so therefore, this is really the scripture and this real scripture doesn't read like the real scriptures read. What does 1 Timothy 3.16 say? And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Here's the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And that underlying Greek word there is theos. Four Greek letters. But in the new little manuscripts, it has two letters. Hos. Who was manifest in the flesh? So by the removal of two Greek letters, by these wicked higher critics... Westcott and Horton, their Jesuit advisors, they remove the deity of Christ from 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy 3.16. And there's a great work on this, among other verses. It's called The Revision Revised by Dean John Bergen, Bishop of Chichester in England, who was the master Greek scholar of his day. And he shows you, along with Herman Hosker and Scrivener and 
other men of God of that day, that 1 Timothy 3.16 should read, God was manifest in the flesh, and only the corrupt manuscripts would have something other than God. Because, you see, the devil hates the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the deity of Christ guarantees the fact that the devil will be defeated by him because the devil cannot be defeated by any other of God's creations. Even Michael has to say, the Lord rebuke thee, Satan, when he contends with Satan over the body of Moses after Moses died and was buried. The Bible said the Lord buried Moses. And so shortly thereafter, Satan comes to get the body. I'm sure he had plans for the body of Moses. So the Lord immediately sends Michael the archangel to contend with him for this body. Don't you let Satan have that body. So Michael didn't say, give me the body. He said, the Lord rebuke thee, Satan, in the book of Jude. And then he takes the body of Moses up into heaven. The next time we see Moses, he's at the transfiguration with Christ. So Michael got the body from Satan, but he had to say, the Lord rebuke thee. That's a good verse for us. When we come under satanic attack, we quote that verse, the Lord rebuke thee, yea, even the Lord that chooseth Jerusalem, which is another identical verse in Zechariah. So we see, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, like the apostle Paul, believed on in the world, received up into glory, all those things. Great verse. This is the mystery of godliness. Parallel to the mystery of godliness is the mystery of iniquity. We read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth or restrains will let or restrain, continue to restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, namely that wicked one, be revealed, who is the Antichrist, the beast, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That's at his second coming, Revelation 19. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, this wicked one, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. The mystery of iniquity, the consummation of it, is the manifestation of that man of lawlessness or the man of sin or the beast or the Antichrist, whatever title you wish to give him. So there are two mysteries that are working on parallel right now. One is the mystery of iniquity. That involves the kingdom of Satan. And the other is the mystery of godliness. that involves the kingdom of God. A biblical dualism. Once again. Again, we see that the Lord has his Christ and Satan has his Antichrist, or the one against Christ. We read that God has his Christ in Matthew 16, 16. As Christ is talking to Peter, Simon Peter, Christ says to him, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Indeed, Jesus of Nazareth, the man who came in the fourth decade of the first century, who declared himself the king of Jerusalem, the Messiah of Israel, was indeed the Christ, according to the prophet Daniel. Chapter 9, verse 25. Another passage where Christ Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, asserts that he's the Christ, the Messiah of Israel. He is before the high priest who has illegally arrested him at night and he's going through this interrogation, this IRS examination, if you please. 
And uh, we read verse 62 of chapter 26 and following. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? Verse 63, But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God. I put you under an oath now. I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Well, the high priest already knew that Jesus, the man Jesus, had already ridden on a colt of a donkey into Jerusalem about four, four days prior to this. They all knew it. They knew that Jesus had declared himself Messiah that day, pursuant to Zechariah 9.9. 9. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, having salvation, riding upon an ass, even upon a colt, the full of an ass, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. I mean, they know that this is Jehovah in front of them, and that he has declared himself Messiah, pursuant to the prophet Zechariah. And now they want him to admit it himself. They want it out of his very mouth. We read. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, and this is an affirmation in the underlying language, Indeed you said, and I am. Indeed I am the Christ. You said it. Nevertheless, I say unto you, I'm going to give you what you want now. I'm going to give you my own profession out of my mouth. Because I know that's what you're looking for, and so I'll tell you. Nevertheless, I say unto you, here, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man. The Son of Man was always a Messianic term. You find it in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Son of Man has nothing to do with the church. You look through all the epistles of the Apostle Paul. Not anywhere does he call him Son of Man. Son of Man is a title for the Messiah of Israel, period, having nothing to do with the church. So he says, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, that's Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord Jehovah said unto my Lord Adonai, Sit thou at my right hand. So Christ is asserting that he's the one that's going to sit at the right hand of Jehovah, pursuant to Psalm 110, verse 1. That's me. You're going to see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and this very same Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. That's Daniel 7, 13. And he's called Son of Man in Daniel 7, 13. That's right. It's me. Pursuant to Psalm 110, verse 1, and Daniel 7, 13, that's my authority to say, indeed, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. Pursuant to Psalm chapter 2. Because he's asking him, the high priest is asking him, I adjure thee, tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Where does he get that question? Where does he get that description? Christ, the Son of God. It's from Psalm chapter 2. The high priest is asking him, are you the one of Psalm chapter 2? Psalm chapter 2, we read verse 1 and following. Why do the heathen, those of the nations, rage? And the people, the people of Israel, imagine a vain thing? Because whenever you see the people, it's generally in the context referring to Israel. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers, namely it's the rulers of the nation of Israel, these Gentile kings of the earth and the rulers of the nation of Israel take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, his Messiah. And that happened in the first century. Here we're going to have a gap between verses here. I know you hate the gap theory, but it's not a theory, it's a fact. Verse 3, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That was done in the first century. He that sitteth in the, and then a gap here of time takes place. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision, when he shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. That's 2,000 years in the future at his second coming. And by the way, when the Lord, that's Adonai, shall have them in derision. This is the Son of God, the Adonai. In the consummation, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. This king that declared himself king of Jerusalem, Jesus of Nazareth, he's going to sit on the holy hill of Zion one of these days in Jerusalem. Now we'll skip on down a little bit. And verse 12, kiss the son, 
lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. So here we have the Son of God and the Christ mentioned in Psalm chapter 2. And the high priest knew this. That's what he was reciting to Jesus. Art thou the Christ of verse 2, Son of the living God of verse 12? Is that you? Christ answers it and says, You've said, nevertheless you've said it. And I know you're referencing Psalm chapter 2, but I want to say it for myself. I'm going to attribute to myself Psalm 110 verse 1 and Daniel 7 13. That's exactly right. That's who I am. And so we have the, the good confession of Christ before the high priest that he was indeed the Messiah, the Christ promised to the nation of Israel. Well, if God has his Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh, that the eternal Son is indwelling the man Christ Jesus, for which reason the Lord Jesus Christ has two natures, one a very man, the other a very God. Theologians would call this the hypostatic union. I'll just simply say that he's God manifest in the flesh. He's very man, very very God. And so we read here in verse 18 of chapter 2, 1 John. Little children, it is the last time as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Well, the Antichrist had not come yet, and this is around 90 A.D. That means none of the Roman Caesars before them were the Antichrist. Nero was not the Antichrist, all you praetorists. The Antichrist was yet to come at the time this book was written by the prophet John, which is at least 90 8090. So the Antichrist is coming. He hadn't come yet, and he hasn't come now. We read in chapter 4 of 1 John, verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. The spirit of Antichrist is in the world, which is Satan, and Antichrist is coming. The end game of Satan is to bring his Antichrist to power, and that Antichrist is also called the beast in Revelation 13. We read in Revelation 13. Verses 1 and 2 speaks of the beast, which is the Roman Empire. And then we get to verse 3. And I saw one of the heads that's on this beast of a Roman Empire wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. You see, Satan's Christ has to be killed too, just like the Lord's Christ. And he has to come back to life again, just as the Lord's Christ did. Satan is a copycat. So this beast, this one of the heads that's on the beast, the empire, because there are seven heads and ten horns, five have fallen, one head it is at the time of the writing of this Domitian, one is yet to come, and it wasn't Constantine either. This seventh king is yet to come, the seventh Roman Caesar, and the seventh Roman Caesar is the final Pope of Rome, because every Pope is a Roman Caesar. One of his titles is King of Rome. And he has a throne in the Vatican for the King of Rome. So the Pope is the placeholder for the future coming seventh Roman Caesar, the final Pope of Rome, to be slain with a sword, as we shall see. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, because you see the dragon is Satan and he's going to indwell the risen body of this final Pope of Rome turned Antichrist. And they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Nobody. This guy's been killed. He's come back to life. He has the power of Satan in him. Nobody can make war with him. This is a final absolutism of the devil using his Jesuit order I maintain to bring the final Pope to power as the Antichrist. 
That's why Melchor Cano, who was a Dominican priest, called the Jesuits the forerunners of the Antichrist. Indeed, the Jesuit order is there to keep the Pope in place so that the final Pope can be the Antichrist. And they, the Jesuits, will be his servants in the kingdom of the Antichrist when he establishes it. So we read here, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. This is literal forty-two months. This is three and a half years. This is the middle of the seventieth week of Daniel where the Pope comes back to life as the Antichrist, and now he's going to rule the world for three and a half years. Then talks about the false prophet. And in verse 14, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. This is the false prophet. This is the second beast. The beast is a Gentile. The false prophet is a Jew. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image or a statue or an idol to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. This final Pope of Rome is going to get a mortal sword wound. This is the Masonic Lodge, the uh, right of Hiram Abiff, where the initiate is hit over the head by the three ruffians, and he comes back to life as the master mason, as the master of the lodge, gives him the lion's grip and whispers Maha bone into his ear, and all of a sudden, well, and the initiate comes back to life, all looking forward to the final Pope of Rome to be slain and rise from the dead to now be a new man, another man, a different man, an eighth Roman Caesar, yet he's one of the seven in Revelation 17.10. This is the Antichrist. This is the beast. If God has his Christ, Satan has his Antichrist. If God's Christ is a man, Satan's Antichrist is a man. If God's Christ is indwelt by the eternal Son of God, why then Satan will indwell the body of the Antichrist so that he can receive worship as he's inside the body of the risen Pope turned Antichrist. He copies God in everything. Satan has a church just like God has a church. God has a church. Those of us who are saved in Christ are members of the church, which is his body, bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, Ephesians chapter 5. Give none offense neither to the Jew nor to the Greek, the Gentile, nor to the church of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 32. God has a church composed of all believers on the Lord Jesus Christ who have been placed into the body of Christ by the Spirit of God upon their belief, by the placing into, by the baptism to place into the body of Christ by their belief, through their belief. So God has his church, and the devil has his church, and I maintain presently that's the Roman Catholic institution. It's Mystery Babylon Religion of Revelation 17. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This mystery religion begins in Babylon, and it carries through to Medo-Persia, and to Greece, and to Rome, and then to Romanism, and ultimately to culminate in the manifestation of the final pope out of Romanism to be the Antichrist. So right now, Satan has a church. And it's the Roman Catholic institution. And it aspires to, the pope aspires to rule all nations, the government of all nations, that's the doctrine of the temporal power. The Pope aspires to rule the consciences of all men. That's the doctrine of the spiritual power. Spiritual power is the gold key. Temporal power is the silver, the, uh, silver key on the flag of the Pope. So the Lord has his church and Satan has his church. And the Jesuits are the most important priests of that church, of Satan's church, because they run it. Lock, stock, and barrel. Now, if Satan has a church and God has his church, Satan seeks to be worshipped as God seeks to be worshipped. Indeed, Satan seeks to be worshipped. That's what he wants. He wants the worship of mankind. 
That's why he gives mankind all these satanic religions based upon good works or works salvation. That's Hinduism, that's Islam. The worst of all is Romanism because it's masking itself as Christian. That's Jehovah Witnessism, that's Mormonism, all the cults in America. Shintoism, Buddhism, all satanic religions designed to take the worshiper away from the free grace and salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ because men want to be able to say, I did something to merit heaven. And that is satanic. It is evil. And so, in Satan wanting worship, he goes after the only man who was not born a sinner. He goes after the only man whose spiritual father has not been the devil. He's going to go after the only man who does not have a sinful nature. He's going to go after the only man that's not under the curse of death. He's going to go after the only man who has special blood in his veins, whereby this man has eternal life right now and he, he cannot die. This is the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's coming after. And so after Christ has fasted 40 days and 40 nights, now he's ready to meet Satan. And what does Satan say to him? Satan, by the way, folks, is a real person. He's invisible. He doesn't have a body. But he is a real person, the most powerful of all of God's creations. Even though he's lost his body is of a cherub. He's still the most powerful. And so Satan comes to Christ and he says, verse 11, uh, verse 8, again the devil taketh him up into a seeding high mountain. Wonder what mountain that was. Wonder if it was Mount Ararat. Who knows? But it was an exceeding high mountain. The devil took him. The devil took him on a little magic carpet ride. The devil has the power to transport his servants through the air, then and now. I watch these old kung fu movies and shows these kung fu fighters. They leap up in the air and they go up into the trees and they're fighting on the trees. They have the power by the power of Satan to do that. Don't you think for one minute they don't? The more you serve Satan, the more power he gives you. Just like Christ, the more you serve him, the more power he gives you. Same deal. So, he takes him up to an exceeding high mountain, and this is the second time. He takes him up there for the first time in Luke, and for the second time, because we read here again, again, the devil. For the second time, the devil taking them up into a seating high mountain, showed them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. I'm going to show you Rome. I'm going to show you Athens. I'm going to show you all the great cities of the world on this flat earth because you can't see all the cities of the world, all these kingdoms, on a globe. So this is another verse for the flat earth. But the Bible teaches flat earth. Classic work on this is David Wardlow Scott's Terra firma, get the book. But the Bible teaches flat earth. You don't really need that book. The earth is a plane. Alexander Gleason proved it in his works. He's the one who put together the Gleason flat earth map. If you don't have one, you need to get one. Alexander Gleason's flat earth map. So the devil takes him up to a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And then he says, And saith unto him, all these things will I give thee. Lucas says, For they are delivered unto me, and I give them to whomsoever I wish. All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. If Jesus the Christ had fallen down to worship Satan, then it would have been the end of everything. Everything. That was a mighty and a powerful temptation because Christ knew that one day he would have all the kingdoms of the world. And uh, the kingdoms of this world would become the kingdoms of the Lord and of, our, of his Christ in Revelation what, chapter 10 thereabouts. 
He knows he has a right to rule on the throne of David, all the nations of the world. And the devil was trying to give it to him before it was time. Before the time. And of course it was a temptation. The Lord Jesus Christ could have sinned. He could have said okay. Because he's very Adam. He's the second Adam. He has a complete and total free will. He's not bound by sin. And the only two men not bound by sin were Adam before he fell and the Lord Jesus Christ. Neither one of them had sin natures. And so they had an absolute and perfect free will. So here's the Lord Jesus Christ. He refuses. But he says, Satan, get thee hence. For it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, only him thou shalt serve. And the devil leaveth him. And the devil left him on the top of that high mountain. And the Lord Jesus Christ told him to get thee hence. Go, leave me here. I don't care. Get thee hence. I know the Lord's going to take care of me. I'm going to get off this mountain. But you get thee hence. You get away from me. Because there's enmity between the seed of the serpent which is the devil inside the serpent that spoke and caused Eve to sin, and then she caused Adam to sin, and so on. And the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's Satan versus Christ in Genesis 3.15, and we see it manifested right here. Satan versus Christ. So, Satan wanted to be worshipped. God seeks to be worshipped. Indeed, God the Father seeks to be worshipped. God the Father enjoys to be worshipped, and he should enjoy it because he's the only one worthy of it. And we should enjoy worship in him because he's, the, because he's the only one that's worth it, that's worthy of that worship. And he rewards us for worshipping him. He blesses us for it. He seeks to be worshipped, and rightfully so. Remember, the four cherubim before the Father... In Revelation chapter 4, they cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. They cease not day and night. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. He's holy. He's not love. That's secondary. He's primarily holy. And so, the Lord seeks to be worshipped. The cherubim worship him. All the host of heaven worship him. The 24 elders, or men representing the church, they worship him. And what does Christ say about this? He says to, his, to the Jewish leaders of that day, or he says to the Samaritans of that day, pardon me, ye worship ye know not what. He's talking to the Samaritan woman. Then he says, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. That is a monumental statement because the Lord Jesus Christ says here now that God's eternal counsel and plan for salvation for mankind is going to come through the Jews, namely the nation of Israel, and through a specific Jew, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, because he comes as the king of the Jews, the Magi come out of the east, we've seen his star, we've come to worship him, where is the king of the Jews? Matthew starts out with king of the Jews and ends with it. Pilate crucifies him, writes in three languages, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Because it's through this Jew, this choice elect stone, tested precious, that the Lord will then be able to bring salvation to all of humanity, all the nations, give them the offer of salvation in Christ, because it's through this one man who just happens to be a dirty kike, a filthy Jew, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Do you see why Satan hates the Jews? Do you see why the Roman Catholic Church hates the Jews? Do you see why the Roman Catholic people are taught to blame the Jews for everything? It's the Rothschilds, it's the Rothschilds, but they're not going to bring their, blame their Roman Catholic giga quadrillionaires like the Palavicinis and the Orsinis and the Aldobrandinis. They're not going to talk about them that are a million times richer than the Rothschilds. Don't talk about them. 
Just blame everything on the Jew because it's those dirty Jews that brought forth Christ, that seed of a woman that's going to bruise my head and I can't stand them for it. That's Satan's attitude. So, Satan seeks to be worshipped and then God seeks to be worshipped because Christ says in the following verse, verse 23 says of this half Jew, half Assyrian woman, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God seeks to be worshipped according to Jesus Christ. And therefore so does Satan. I want all the worship that God wants. I'm better than him. I'm Satan. And I will be worshipped. God will be worshipped in the end. Because you see, at the knee of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. And they will worship him whether or not they're saved or lost. Those that are lost are going to worship him before they're cast alive in the lake of fire. God, the Son, will be worshipped by all men someday. Whether in salvation or in condemnation at the great white throne. Satan seeks to be worshipped and so does God. Satan accuses the saints. Satan accuses the believers in Christ when they fall into sin. How do we know that? Revelation 11.10 Satan is the accuser of the brethren that exists during this time of the 70th week of Daniel. But if he's the accuser of the brethren then, he's accuser now. In chapter 12, verse 10, we read, this is when Satan is cast out of heaven, confined to the earth, in the middle of the 70th week of Daniel, right at the time the final pope of Rome is slain and risen with the, risen uh, from the dead so that Satan can indwell him. Verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan accuses. Look at that. You think you can save Eric John Phelps? Just look what he did here. Look what he said there. Look at that. But what's the answer in the scripture? There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself or his life a ransom for all to be testified of in due time. 1 Timothy what, 2, 4, and 5. The mediator is the intercessor. He is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, Psalm 110, verse 4. And this, is, this whole topic of him being a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek is completely exploded in Hebrews 5, 6, and 7. He is this great high priest, the king of Salem, with no recorded beginning of days nor end of life. Melchizedek is made like unto the Son of God in all the ways. He's not the Son of God, but he's a type of the Son of God. And so Christ is this wonderful high priest after the order of Melchizedek, whoever liveth to make intercession to them for the coming to God by him. He ever liveth to make intercession. We read in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24. But this man, because he continueth ever, or forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Of course, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. <laughs> for such a high priest became us. It was fitting that we should have such a great high priest because we're so depraved. To the degree of our depravity is the degree we needed a high priest in all his purity and perfection. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's? For this he did once when he offered up himself, making every sacrifice of the Mass a blasphemy, according to Hebrews chapter 7, 
verse 27. So he's our intercessor. And the Spirit of God intercedes for, intercedes for us with groanings too deep to be uttered in Romans chapter 8. But the great intercessor is Christ himself. The only way to God the Father is through the intercessor, the Lord Jesus Christ. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what he said in the book of John, with chapter 10. And so, God has an intercessor, and Satan is our accuser. But you know what? Praise God. The Lord never lost a case. If he didn't lose me, then he's not lost a case. We go on. Satan has his ministers. In 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen to 15, we read, For such, verse 13, Oh, pardon me. Yeah, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. We should marvel at this. Why? For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, like Moroni, when he speaks to Joseph Smith, giving him the golden tablets, and he's going to speak to the angel Moroni. If that really happened, it was the devil that spoke to Joseph Smith which means the entire Mormon religion is of the devil. It's a work salvation religion, and it's also Masonic, which is really of the devil also, serving the Pope of Rome at the top. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, the devil has ministers, if they also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works, that's right. There are ministers of the devil pre pre pretending to be ministers of Christ, like Billy Graham. He's one of them. And I'll make a decision for Christ. No, you're not. You're in sin. You're lost. You're undone. You hate God. And you need to be saved. And if you do not repent, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Billy Graham never preached like that. He wanted you to make a decision for Christ. Make a decision. Yeah. You need to repent. And believe the gospel. The message of the gospel is offensive. It doesn't make you friends with the unsaved unless God is working on the hearts of that unsaved elect. And then there's a host of others. Kenneth Copeland and who's that other crazy lunatic? I mean, they're everywhere. Joel Osteen, they're all ministers of the devil serving Satan with their your best life now and all this other heresy. Listen, the Lord's people, many of them suffered for many years in agony in the dungeons of the Inquisition. Your best life now? Huh? Are you kidding? All these ministers of the devil masquerading as ministers of Christ. And the reason why they're not identified as such is because no one really knows sound doctrine and don't, do not spend time in the scripture. Giving us discernment as who's of God and who's not. So, we have the devil, the min devil has his ministers, and they're everywhere. It's the majority of them. And all those ministers are busy using the devil's Bible. All the new versions based on the devil's Westcott and Hort Greek text, the Eberhard Nessel Greek text, Kurt Alan Greek text, Huh. All this Chris Bach, Lockman, and Tegretrigales, all these sinners, these infidels, you didn't even believe the gospel, and you're going to use their Greek text of higher criticism. We're going to apply the doctrines of evolution to the scriptures. Why? The devil has his Bible for all of his servants. It's just pitiful that some of the Lord's servants are using the devil's Bible, and they're not using a Reformation English Bible, whether it be the AV 1611 or the Geneva Bible. We're not going to use it. That's why the church is apostate in America. That's why judgment set in. That's why they're bringing all these black savage Haitians into Pennsylvania and black savage Haitians into, where's another place they brought them into? Ohio. And we're going to bring in all these Somalia, black savage Muslim Somalis into Lutheran Minnesota because all the Protestant churches are apostate. And so it's the judgment of God by using these black savages that hate us to kill us, to persecute us, and to ultimately drive us white men into the new right where we can get 
all lynched up with Donald Trump and the new right to go out and round up these sinners and kill them. And that's exactly what's going to happen. All you Haitians, if you hear this broadcast, you need to go right back to Haiti because you're going to be rounded up. All you Somalis, you better go back to Somalia, that savage dung hole, because you're going to be rounded up. And if I didn't believe the Bible, and if I wasn't saved, and if I didn't know the machinations of the Jesuits, I'd be out there rounding you up too, remember the new right, and I'd love doing it. Time to get even. Time for payback. But no, what we need to do is separate. Our county needs to declare its independence and start our own new nation once again. And for me, it will be for white people that are Bible-believing people, no secret societies, no blacks, no Asians, n no uh, Hispanics. All you people, you have your country and I have mine. You allow me to be my country, my, my, uh, my race, language, and culture, and you can have yours, and I'll defend your right to your race, language, and culture. But they're continuing this agitation. But those in Christ, those of us who know the designs of Satan, are not going along with it. And we will have our counties declare their independence before we join the new right and Donald Trump or Vance or any of these other guys that are coming along as the saviors of the white race people that are so victimized, and we are so victimized for the last 90 years. I look at those black savage witches in that, that woman's basketball league jamming, jagging their eye, jamming their long fingernails into the eyes of the Roman Catholic white girl, Caitlin Clark, and knocking her down and beating her up. What do you think that's about? That's a deliberate agitation to drive all the white people in the new right. Nobody calling a foul. It's all a design. Because Satan has his mystery of iniquity to destroy Western civilization born out of the Protestant Reformation. And the Lord is permitting it to happen or even causing it to happen because the Lord's church is apostate. It's departed from the Bible. And it doesn't preach the true gospel. And it doesn't suffer for righteousness sake anymore. Used to. So Satan has his ministers and God has his ministers. In 2 Corinthians 6, 4, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things and having your best life now forgot that one the apostle forgot that holy ghost didn't you we are ministers of god we're able ministers of god in another context god has his ministers we're not walking around in priestial robes and going holy and putting our hands together and all this religious nonsense we're ministers of god we've been equipped with the armor of God, we have the word of God, we have the power of the spirit of God to live a righteous life, to resist Satan. And there, these indeed are the Lord's ministers. We're kings and priests, according to Revelation 5.9. God has his ministers and the devil has his ministers. And it's up to you to discern between the two as you read the Bible. Well, Satan has his doctrine. They're called doctrines of devils, and he's got a lot of them. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, this is not the last days, but in the latter times of the church, some shall depart from the faith. The last days have to do with the 70th week of Daniel. The latter times have to do with the church. The latter times of the church. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There will be some believers who will give heed to doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And what are some of these doctrines of devils? Well, forbidding to marry. 
Let's just live together. And commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created, to be received with thanksgiving of them that which believe and know the truth. Vegetarianism. Vegetarianism is a doctrine of Satan. Vegetarianism precipitates demon possession, I will also add. You become more subject to demon control if you're a Christian, if you're saved. And if you're not saved, you become more subject to demon possession where they can indwell you. Hitler was a vegetarian, and he was most thoroughly demon-possessed as you watch his speeches. Vegetarianism gives power to Satan's host to embolden them to do what they want to do because meat-eating has something to do with resisting satanic attack. Abstaining from meats. So these are two of the doctrines of Satan. Don't get married, just live together. There's about, what, 50% of the American population is doing that right now? And just and now we have all this paganism here in this country, and part of the paganism is we're not going to eat meat. Yeah. So we can become estrogen dominant because meat is involved in the creation of testosterone in men. And if you lack testosterone, you're going to be a weak man. There'll be a weak manhood, and nations are built on men. And if men are not strong, the nation will be weak. Like India. All the great military nations of the last 2,000 years have been meat-eating peoples, including America. So, Satan has doctrines. And God has doctrines. We read in Titus chapter 2, verse 10. Titus chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, verse 9 and 10. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. What? Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters? Well, no, no, we're going to advocate for universal abolition of the institution of slavery. Master-servant relationship. That's what we're going to do. That's not what the Bible says. The whole, ab the whole abolition movement in the 1800s was sin. When slavery was gradually being abolished in Virginia and the freed slaves were being repatriated to Liberia, it was a gradual thing that was happening. The Protestants were leading it. We aren't told that, are we? Well, you can read all about it in a book called History of Slavery and the Slave Trade by W.O. Blake, written in 1860. It's a thousand pages. Get educated on what the real institution of slavery was going on here in North America. Oh, no. We're going to have an Emancipation Proclamation. Don't you think for one second Abraham Lincoln had any love for the blacks? He just wanted to use the Emancipation Proclamation to weaken the South so they would lose the war in conjunction with being betrayed by Robert E. Lee at Gettysburg and betrayed by Jefferson Davis, that friend of the Jesuits, what was his name, Darius Huber, the leading Jesuit chaplain of the Confederacy, so we can defend and we can destroy the white Protestants and Baptists and the black Baptists of the South with that military occupation under Reconstruction. I mean, all this premised upon a lie that slavery was sin, that the institution of owner of property, labor in a man was sin. That's all a lie. We go on. Exhort uh, servants to be obedient to their own masters, to please them well in all things, not answering again, not, not back-talking, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. That you might wear the doctrine of God. How are you doing that? By yielding to the Spirit of God to, to have the fruit of the Spirit. We wear the doctrine of God. Well, honey, what are you, what are you wearing today? I'm wearing the doctrine of God. Yeah. So Satan has a doctrine and the Lord's people have a doctrine. God has a doctrine. And lastly, in contrast, Satan is man-centered and God is God-centered. It's God versus man as man is energized by Satan. 
We read in Matthew 16, 21. We read again in Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and rise again the third day. Now, how do you think that impacted the disciples? Wait a second. We've been preaching the gospel of the kingdom for the last three and a half years here. We've been preaching that Christ is going to sit on the throne of David. He's going to establish the divinity kingdom. We've been teaching this. Behold, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The time for the reestablishment of the Davidic kingdom under Christ Jesus is at hand. And now he tells him he's going to have to be killed and rise from the dead? What? Verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, <laughs> saying, Be it far from me, from thee, Lord, that this shall not be unto thee. You can't do this. And what does Christ do here in verse 23? But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. That means Satan was influencing Peter to say that. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Yeah, back to Genesis 3.15. There's enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. You're an offense to me. For thou savorest. You are centered upon, you think about, not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Satan is preoccupied in the affairs of men because it's with the affairs of men and the control of nations and men of power that he intends to bring his Antichrist, the final Pope of Rome, to power to rule the world. So he's completely given over with men's affairs. He couldn't care less about God, except how to resist him. So, Satan is man-centered and Christ is God-centered. If there be any way, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but thine be done, my Father. He was God-centered, and so because he was God-centered, he will go to the cross. Satan is man-centered, so that means he'll do anything to use any man to purposely bring to pass his mystery of iniquity. And when Satan is done with that man, he discards him, kills him, whatever, and moves on to the next man to further Satan's mystery of iniquity. Whereas God uses his elect to further his mystery of godliness. He uses us to get the gospel out, to call men to repentance, to believe the gospel in faith, which is what I'm doing to you today for you today. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. But now you know the parallels of Satan and God, how that Satan copies God in his quest to be supreme, how Satan copies God. I trust this is informative for you and a blessing to you. Brother Eric John Phelps, the podcast of 24-7 World Radio. Please pray for me two minutes a day, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. That the Lord would give me boldness of speech in proclaiming his truth, living a righteous and a holy life. And send your gifts to RBT, P.O. Box 306, Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, 17073. Or you can send it to Cash App. That's Eric, E-R-I-C, John, J-O-N, Phelps, P-H-E-L-P-S. The cash app, or you can send something by PayPal, which is RBPB, RBPB donate at Comcast.net, RBPB donate at Comcast.net. So there's three ways to give. Appreciate your gifts. It keeps me going, keeps me able to give these podcasts. Without these gifts, I cannot continue. So please send them as you're able, as the Lord lays it upon your heart. And lastly, May the Lord bless you on this Lord's Day as you seek to do His will according to His word, the AB 1611 Reformation English Bible. Till the next time we meet, Maranatha.